Hello everybody. Hello YouTube. Hello art history enthusiasts and visual culture aficionados. It's me again, Miss M, and I'm back with another video. And again, this is going to be part of my Hunter Biden series where I will go through each and every one of his paintings featured here on this website for this gallery that represents him for the fall 2021 exhibition the journey home uh, scroll down and you can see all of these now today which painting am i going to be discussing today the first few paintings that i discuss in these videos are going to be what I like to call his self-portraits. I don't know if that makes a whole bunch of sense, but when you look at these paintings, just, you know, quickly, this collection here, right, we don't see, really, anything that obviously, obviously looks like a self-portrait. <laughs> this up here is a photo of him, but down here, when you when you scroll through these, you don't see things that right away look like an image of Hunter, all right? But they're there. They're there. Sometimes they're, um, he hides them, okay? Uh, and other times it's just kind of an indirect self-portrait or a self-portrait via symbolism. So, what I'm going to do, I think, yeah, this is the one that I'm going to discuss today. It is called, let me go back, it is called, there it is, Bluebird and Coyote. All right, it's mixed media on metallic paper, 74 by 56 inches. That's huge. Let me click on it so you can see it. 74 by 56 inches mixed media on metallic paper 74 inches just to give you a, a kind of a um, an idea of how tall it would be in real life 72 inches is six feet okay 12 inches uh, is in each foot so 12 times 6 is 72 so this is as tall as a full-grown adult man just again just to give you an idea of the size of this thing. I know, uh, I, I did the walkthrough yesterday at the this website that is provided by the gallery. This thing, this, where is it? Oh yeah, here, here's the link. <clears throat> you can click if you want to do the virtual walkthrough or virtual gallery visit for this exhibition, The Journey Home. When you saw it yes, in the overview video yesterday, this one, this, this, well, no, this one, sorry, uh, Hunter Biden Fall 2021 Exhibition Overview. <clears throat> when I did the walk, walk through, um, the Bluebird and Coyote painting was above the staircase and it didn't look so big. I don't know, I, I, I don't know anything about pho photography or cameras or film or what have you, but it didn't look so big to me. And then today I <laughs> took a better look and it said 74 inches. I said, wow, that is big. That's a big painting. It would take up <laughs> a lot of space on a wall in, in an ordinary home. And before I say anything about the Bluebird and Coyote painting, and I don't know if I'm going to say very much, I'm just going to highlight some things about that painting and maybe then let the painting do the rest of the speaking for itself. Uh, I want to tie up some loose ends from the overview video. I said yesterday, I was talking about this article from the New York Times, which if you note, it is not behind a paywall. Not behind a paywall. This article that they use to hype up the exhibit, this one here, you, you click on that, it's behind a paywall. But this one is not. This one that was published in February of 2020 and updated in August of 2021. So I, I was, I said I was going to talk about one of these photos in this article, and I'm trying to find it. There it is. This one. His process with alcohol ink. 
All right. That's what this article, this is an interesting article. So I really do suggest that you look at, look at it. Um, and I've added my blog post, a link to my blog post with all those many, 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 many links that I talked about to various articles discussing Hunter, his art, and some things that are not necessarily related to the his art but could be it depends on how you look at it that's the blog post it's in the overview or in the description of the overview video check it out if you're interested um, and before I go any further I want to take care of some church announcements you know I'm just starting out I'm having fun I hope whoever's watching these is having fun too and you know, learning right along with me. Again, I'm doing this straight from the dome, as they say. Uh, no preparation, no notes, no nothing. I just get my little links ready and my tabs in my browser, and I switch on the screen recorder, and I I get to talking. So that's what I'm doing. But w what I mean to say is if you enjoy this, if you're liking it, if you're having fun, uh, please consider subscribing and or commenting in the videos. Uh, it would it would mean a, a great deal to me to, to know that people are watching this and hopefully enjoying it and especially if you leave a comment or something to let me know what you think of what I've got to say about these uh, paintings and you know whatever else I discuss in future videos that I I'm pretty sure I'll be making. But um, anyway, now that we got that out the way, <laughs> as Steve Harvey would say, uh, let's get going with this article that, again, I'm tying up loose ends from the overview video. It talks about his press, his technical process, not how he chooses his subject matter so much, but like how he paints, right? So I think I read this part yesterday in the overview video. And Hunter Biden is asking whoever it is, I guess Adam uh, Papescu, the person who's interviewing him, this seems like Hunter asking, what do you see? And they've, they've put the word you in italics. That's a, that's a clue. Okay. But, and then the writer says, the more critical, says, writes, the more critical question might be, how does it look to the outside world? That's interesting, to me anyway. And again, uh, look at these. These are, again, I don't think, or I don't know whether or not these are in the, I don't think, no, they're, they're not in the fall 2021 exhibit, at least not these paintings featured at the gallery or that we saw in our walkthrough. So these, the paintings that you see here were in the walkthrough, all of them, but you know, looks like some of them just maybe they got sold even before the exhibit started. I don't know. Uh, this one's called Rain Number One. This is called Telescope Number One. And the author says, where is it? Mm. I know I saw it. <laughs> I'm gonna have to do a Control F uh, search, but. Uh, yeah, looks like it. Um, oh, micro. There it is. Thank you, Control F. So here we go. It, yeah, and I read this too. I should have should have remembered it, but no, too many too many things floating around in my head. It was uh, the studio. He's describing the studio. It was filled with colorful works of decorative abstraction, psychedelic florals, and ethereal patterns that look like nature. Viewed through a microscope, leaning towards the surreal. Mm. I, I'm still struck by that passage through a microscope. I'm not even going to say what I think it means. I'm going to do what maybe I think Hunter wants his the viewers of his art to do. I want you to use your imagination. The writer of this article wrote this, viewed through a microscope. That's an interesting observation. That's an interesting interpretation, viewed through a microscope. Okay. And Hunter asks, what do you see? He kind of answers that question here, but what do you see, viewer? 
What do you see in his paintings if you look at them? Anyway, and I said, what was interesting to me was this picture. He's got a straw. And I know what it looks like. And again, I, like I said, I'm not going to talk about the skin. No. But he's got a straw in his mouth and he's blowing air through the straw onto this surface. He's, his process with alcohol ink. It can take 14 layers for the material to adhere. It includes blowing it with a metal straw. Hunter says you have to be really focused in order to be able to alter it to your own imagination. Y'all, people, there's a lot going on there. This one also struck me, this, this here, this part. Some of his images looked eerily reminiscent of the artist and his father, but the suggestion was rejected. They're no one. Mm. Okay, so he blows air through a straw onto this particular t type of paper that he seems to enjoy using for a lot of his images that he makes, a lot of his works. It's called Yupo paper, but I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. The air though, okay, the air coming through the straw. Um, what's going on with that? Why, why? We did that in, well, we, a lot of us, did that in kindergarten. They gave us a straw, they gave us a piece of paper, they gave us some black ink, and we made little trees and things with with that technique that Hunter is using here. <laughs> it's very reminiscent, at least my kindergarten, where, where I went, my kindergarten teacher, when I was a little, little, little girl. Mm. I'm sure I'm, I, sh I should look up, like, specifically where that comes from, the origin of this painting technique, but... For now, there's a lot of things I'm going to have to come back to later, but this this struck me. This and the 14 layers, how, how many times he has to put this ink onto the same sheet of paper in order for it to adhere. Ink, air, breath, paper, the, the type of paper, yippo. Oof, let me let me let me go get to it. This is what I'm talking about. When I heard, when I saw saw this, and I realized what he was doing, blowing air into this straw onto the paper to manipulate the ink. This is what I thought of, and I found this website. It doesn't matter um, where you know what what website it is or whatever, but this is obviously about the Bible. It's a the Old Testament, the Book of Genesis. Hebrew, the Lord God formed man from the dust of the earth. He blew into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. And you've got the different, like, translations of the Bible, I guess, and then they're translated into English, which is just weird to me, but whatever. Um, Greek, and God formed the dust from the earth into a man, and he blew into his face a breath of life, and the man became a living soul. Hmm. This is interesting, isn't it? The breath of life. The breath of life. God used it according to the Bible, according to the book of Genesis and the story of the creation of Adam. Air is one of the things that made the creation of human beings possible, according to this story from the Bible. And air or breath is mentioned many times in the Bible. You just, you know, if you're interested, go ahead and look it up in your own time. Um, I'm hoping that this video won't be as long as <laughs> the overview one, but ain't no telling. Uh, the next thing I thought of was the Vedas, right? Uh, what are the Vedas? The Vedas are a large body of religious texts originating in ancient India, composed of Vedic Sanskrit. Uh, the, text, the texts constitute the oldest layer of Sanskrit literature and the oldest scriptures of Hinduism. Now, you might say, what, what is she doing? Why is she bringing this up? Well, 
where's my thing here? This is why. Remember what we talked about yesterday in the overview video about comparative mythology, comparative religion. And I think I, I mentioned metaphysics because that was one of the links in the, in the Wikipedia uh, articles. I, one thing I didn't mention, meta-narratives. That's a huge part of all of this. That's a huge part of this monomyth that Joseph Campbell discusses. That it's a huge part of the study of comparative mythology and comparative religion. Meta narratives. That means stories that are stacked one on top of the other, kind of like a layer cake. And it's hard to figure out in many cases, in many cultures across planet Earth, it's difficult to figure out where a story is really originally from, what culture, what place, what particular location on planet Earth, languages, uh, chronology, what have you. And it all becomes kind of a mishmash, or it just, like I said, layer cake. Layer cake. And that doesn't make one story's origin better than another story's origin. It's just different and it's debatable because it's in some some cases in a lot of cases it's hard to pinpoint where something came from a lot of cultures that we think are very original uh i don't know you know things that you learned in school like ancient greece ancient rome these are really good examples and you think that their mythology and their cultural literature and what have you is extremely like authentic to them no, they got it from somewhere else, and they put their own spin on it. And the people that they got it from, the culture they got it from, they got it from somebody before them. Or sometimes two different cultures were developing basically concurrently to each other, and they exchanged ideas, and, some, and it became difficult to really identify one from the other and know which was which. But... That's what I'm talking about when I say meta narratives and what we talked about yesterday, comparative mythology, comparative religion. That is an extremely important thing to know. I'm not going to go into great detail, but again, for the curious, that's where you begin with um, Hunter and his, and many other artists. This is not just Hunter. No, there's a lot of this going on in art throughout time throughout time and space and uh, what have you. But anyway, air, breath, Vedas, Hinduism. Yes. Yes. So you'll, you'll begin to see it. Maybe things that I don't even say you'll see without me even having to say them. He's mixing and matching Christianity, uh, Greek, Roman, I guess for lack of a better word, paganism, uh, these Eastern religions, Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, maybe even religions or belief systems from places like Oceania or what have you. He's, he's drawing from all of those. He really, like, he's serious about this. He put this here for Hunter. I think it's Hunter. Put this here for a reason. For a reason. So let me go back to the Vedas very quickly. Why am I bringing them up in the context of breath? Because of this one, the Prashna Upanishad, um, which is just one of these Vedas. And each Veda it concerns itself with talking about or explaining a particular kind of um, subject area within whatever it is that they're trying to achieve in, in this writing. Now, this one, let me... Control F. Breath. What? What? Why breath? Breath. 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 The Prashna in verses two point three and two point four, the Prashna Upanishad states that prana, breath spirit, is the most essential and powerful of all because without it, all other deities cannot survive in a creature. They only exist when prana, breath is present. The deities manifest their power because of and in honor of prana. 
spirit manifests itself in nature as well as life, etc., etc. Okay. Breath. Prana. It is the life breath which interfaces self to all organs and life in the human body, states the Upanishad. Uh-huh. Okay. Prana, breath, life force, does not sleep. Hmm. Think about this for a second. Think about it for a second, okay? I'm trying to point, point some stuff out. In order to talk, you need to also be able to breathe. And talking, speaking, is the fundament of storytelling. <laughs> All right, that's what he's doing. With his straw and the breath that's coming from him and this paper, and I'm going to talk about the paper in a minute. And the alcohol ink. Alcohol ink. Oh, good heavens. It just hit me. Like I said, I'm learning right along with you in real time. Um, alcohol. I'm going to talk about this when we, when I start doing my shining videos from, yeah. I'm going to do a lot of video. I'm going to do a lot of video. Yeah. Sorry. I'm going to do a lot of videos on Hunter Biden. And I'm going to do a lot of videos on The Shining, so get ready. But I'm going to... What's another word for alcohol, people? Spirit. Hmm. Breath, spirit, and this paper, though. Okay, so he seems to be quite fond of Yupo paper. Yupo. Yupo. Where is it? There's more. I know there's more. Yupo. This thing. Is this on Yupo? Let's see. Gosh, I hope so. There it is. Yeah, Yupo. What is Yupo? Let me find it. I know. I know. I set aside a little thing here. Oh, okay. There we go. Here, Here's the wicked, trusty old Wikipedia. We can always rely on her. Wikipedia. Uh, the Yupo Corporation is a Japanese manufacturer of synthetic paper. It is the largest manufacturer of synthetic paper in the world with a 70% market share. It is owned by Mitsubishi Chemical and OG Holdings, also known as the OG Paper Company. The firm produces the Yupo brand of polypropylene. No. Uh, polypropylene. There you go polypropylene <laughs> synthetic paper. Okay, that tells us a little bit about the company, but it doesn't tell us very much about the paper at all. It just tells us that it's made of polypropylene and it's synthetic. Okay, cool. Uh, why is it important and why might Hunter, the artist that is obviously very concerned with meta-narratives and comparative mythology and comparative religion, um, and who listens to philosophy podcasts while he's in the studio and probably knows a lot of philosophy and mythology himself, probably just from his education. And he's got a pretty good one. Let me tell you, uh, I'm talking about Hunter right now. Uh, why would he want this paper? We already, I already kind of explained the breath and in my own way, I explained the alcohol ink. Why is he using it? I mentioned one possibility. It's a synonym for the word spirit. Okay, let's get to this Yupo paper. What is Yupo? This is from YupoUSA.com. Uh, what is Yupo? Yupo is the recyclable, waterproof, tree-free synthetic paper with attributes and properties that make it the perfect solution for a variety of marketing, design, packaging, and labeling needs. Apparently, this stuff is indestructible. I think the article even says that. <laughs> Okay, I'm not going to try uh, weeding through that, but did, did did you see it? It's waterproof. Cool. It's recyclable. But I think Hunter is using this because it's tree-free. Tree-free. Like, I know you're listening. If you're listening to me and you're thinking... Ooh, so what? Tree free. Big deal. Well, let me go back. Remember yesterday, wait, where was I? Sorry, let me, this is, you know, this here. Okay. All right. 14 layers 
to adhere to this Yupo paper. Should I, let me see if they mention Yupo in this article. Yep. Indestructible. There it is. I know I saw it somewhere. He said it could take 14 layers of alcohol ink for the material to adhere to the nearly indestructible Japanese Yupo paper he uses as his canvases. He blows the ink with a metal straw. It is fast drying and has natural progression. And you have to be really focused in order to be able to alter it to your own imagination. I think I already mentioned this. He's basically putting himself in the place of God. Here. He's, is he blaspheming? I don't know. I, I don't know. But, I, I, yes, I said it. I said it. I asked the question, is he blaspheming? And I'm not saying that's a good or a bad thing. I'm just identifying it as a possibility. Um, you know, Yupa paper. It's tree free. Uh, tree, tree, think people. Tree. We talked about one kind of indirectly yesterday when I did the walkthrough. <laughs> Look at it. Remember I talked about this little room that seemed creepy to me and there's this picture in there that seems to be all alone in this other, other than the couch, empty room, and other than this one little light completely in, in a sort of darkness. This creeped me out. And then I found, uh, where is that thing? Oh, there, here it is. In this in this uh, architect, is it architect? No, art news, artnet news. This photo with the first floor, the top floor, and they've got all these paintings here that you can see, but the room where that little tree picture is, mm -mm, no, they've got that door closed for some reason. I, I, I found this creepy. I find this even creepier. But that's just me. And then the this is the Architectural Digest one. Um, this is the photo. Some Who did this photo? Wow. The lighting in this gallery is amazing, I must say, just based on these pictures. But look, and you have to step through a door. Oh, good heavens. Again, I, I don't know um, what to make of this. And... It, oh, look at the shadows of these doors create create it's not it this is not like a dark lacquered black door frame it's just the shadows created by these multiple this i'm sorry i'm tongue-tied again the door is within this niche of sorts and it creates this depth and it creates these shadows that make it look like a door frame and a black one at that and then they turned the light off in this room and just put the spotlight on this painting. And this painting, at least to me, it looks like a painting of a tree. Tree three. This is this is what creeped me out yesterday. This room and the fact that this little, again doesn't look like a huge painting because I, I compared it to the size of the couch. The, the two-seater sofa beneath it, but trees, trees, trees. Where do we get trees, people? They play prominent roles in many different mythologies and religions, including Judeo-Christianity. There's that tree. And we're going to talk about trees, in the again, in the upcoming videos of his um, other paintings that I, that I review in this series. But trees... The paper is tree-free, and I don't think he chose that just because it's sustainable or it's good for the earth or whatever. No, he I think he chose that very deliberately. He wants the paper to be tree-free, and again, I'll talk about why in future videos. So let me just go through my little links here. I talked about that. Alcohol, air, or sorry, spirit, air, tree-free paper, hmm, meta-narratives, speaking things into existence kind of like a god and if you you know research you can google just like i did <laughs> you can find stories of gods uh, using their breath to do these big things to create worlds and you know the 
God from the Bible, did that to create the first human being, according to their version of the story, the first human being, Adam. Mm. And we have the Vedas, and we have this prana, or prashna, uh, Upanishad. Mm. Interesting. So I talked about that, talked about this, talked, ooh, talked about this, talked about this, Talked about we're talk, talked about this a little bit now. We'll talk about it later. The trees, oh, so many trees, in Hunter's paintings. Talked about the Yupo manufacture, and now finally, the reason why we're all here. <laughs> this uh, video is about bluebird and coyote by Hunter Biden. You know, when if you want to go back to the website, click on it, look at it, think about it, and here on time, please do that. But I thought what in the world is going on here in this painting and this is one that i've designated just me that's my opinion designated this as a self-portrait type of deal that we've got going on here why did i say that well like i said he he might be using this bluebird figure to as 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 a as a tool in order to talk about himself. So no, Hunter, as far as I can see, is not pictured here. But there's the bird. There's this part of the bird, which is very curious, and I haven't even... I mean, I've looked at it, but I, I haven't tried to figure it out, but I know it's something. <clears throat> Don't know what it is, but it's something. Uh, there's these little branches, these little dots that he probably made with a straw. Wow. Okay, so where does this come from? This I said mythology. Okay, so where does it come from? I looked it up. I, and this website is a blogspot website, but it's, I guess, done by the University of Oklahoma, and it's content for a course in myth and folklore taught there. Uh, myth and folklore. Oh, this is cool. The untextbook. I like this. Anyway, so the story is a story from... Uh, where does it say? Pima, Arizona, right? So Native American. And it's called How Bluebird and Coyote Got Their Colors. Okay, it's a Pima story about the coyote explaining why he is now the color of dirt, while the bluebird, who was once ugly, is now a beautiful blue color. Notice that there's no coyote here in this painting. Uh uh, it's just a, it's just a bird, the bluebird, and you can see little spots of brown in the feathers and near the neck. Um, and also, please note, the bluebird in this painting is not facing the viewer; it's got its it's turned its back on the viewer. That could mean something; it could mean nothing. But I thought it was worth noting. Uh, so yeah, there's no coyote here. It's just the bird. It's just the bird. And he even names it. He even titles this painting, Bluebird and Coyote. Let me click on it. Yeah, there it is, Bluebird and Coyote. So he's not being ambiguous. He's letting you know very precisely where he's gotten the inspiration for this painting. So let's go back to this one. Uh, uh, this this story is part of the Southwestern and California Legends unit. Oh, so I guess they're talking about the class, and the one that you see here, I guess, is from what's well, the source? Myths and Legends of California in the Old Southwest by Catherine Barry Judson, 1912. So let me just read this story right quick. How Bluebird and Coyote Got Their Colors A long time ago, the bluebird was a very ugly color. But Bluebird knew of a lake where no river flowed in or out, and he bathed in this four times every morning for four mornings. Every morning he sang a magic song. There's a blue water, it lies there, I went in, I am all blue. On the fourth morning, Bluebird shed all his feathers and came out of the lake, just in his skin. But the next morning, when he came out of the lake, he was covered with blue feathers. Now, doesn't this picture look very similar to 
Hunter's painting, except we can see the bird's face here. Moving on. Now, all this while Coyote had been watching Bluebird. He wanted to jump in and get him to eat, but he was afraid of the water. But on the last morning, Coyote said, How is it you have lost all your ugly color, and now you are blue and gay and beautiful? You are more beautiful than anything that flies in the air. I want to be blue, too. Now, Coyote at that time was a bright green. I only went in four times on four mornings, said Bluebird. He taught Coyote the magic song, and Coyote went in four times, and the fifth time he came out as blue as the little bird. Then Coyote was very, very proud because he was a blue coyote. He was so proud that as he walked along, he looked around on every side to see if anybody was looking at him now that he was a blue coyote and so beautiful. He looked to see if his shadow was blue too. But Coyote was so busy watching to see if others were noticing him that he did not watch the trail. By and by, he ran into a stump so hard that it threw him down on, in the dirt, and he was covered with dust all over. You may know this is true because even today, coyotes are the color of dirt. And they provide an image <laughs> to illustrate that, yes, as a matter of fact, this coyote is almost indistinguishable from his dirt-colored background here. Um, and then go back to the bluebird, and then go back to Hunter's bluebird, bluebird and coyote. Now, what is Hunter trying to say by using this story as an inspiration for this painting? I think it's autobiographical. I could be wrong. It's happened before. <laughs> I've been wrong before, and I'll probably be wrong again, so, you know, that's that. But... It's interesting. It's very interesting. And he signs this painting. Doesn't sign all of them, but this one he signs. R. H. Robert Hunter Biden. Hmm. Make of that what you will. Is he saying that I think he's saying that he's the bluebird, he's achieved. He's he's bathed himself literally in this blueness. Blue is the color of beautiful water. And this coyote character, he first he's trying to eat the bird, and then he gets kind of jealous of the bird because the bird's so beautiful. And he asks the bird, like, what did you do to get blue? And the blue bird tells him, and then coyote does it, and he succeeds. But it doesn't last for long because coyote is coyote. And Coyote's going to do what coyotes do, act a fool, and run into a stump and get all dirty and, and dirt, uh, ugly again. I don't think he's ugly, but, you know, he's not blue anymore. And he started out green, too. He started out green, and he wanted to be blue. I guess his, his jealousy, he was, he was envious of the bluebird's beautiful color. And... But his own nature, the coyote's own kind of villainous nature. I mean, he wanted to eat that bird, so I, I guess he could, he could be classified as a villain. His own villainous nature prevented him from achieving whatever the bluebird has achieved, its beauty. So, one, you know, that's one difference between the two animals. Another difference is the bluebird can fly and the coyote can't. So... Again, make of that what you will. Coyote was dragged through the mud by his he he he, uh, he and he himself, the coyote, was the cause of his own undoing. Be getting dragged through the mud, the dirt. That's um, I can't think of the word. That's that's um, symbolic of something. That's a euphemism for something. That's the word, euphemism. Somebody got dragged through the mud, and it wasn't the bluebird. But the person who was the person, what am I saying? The animal, the coyote, that was trying to eat him. 
Hmm. Imagine that. Anyway, so this is this is that, and uh, we talked about Joseph Campbell, but there's another bluebird that I think, personally, me, I think, might also have maybe that maybe Hunter is referring to, or alluding to in this story about the bluebird and the coyote. And let me show you that one. There, there it is. <laughs> The bird. The bluebird. I don't know if any of you were paying attention, but when, when all this stuff was going on and being reported about Hunter, about his father, about all this stuff, a lot of it was happening, you know, right here. Well, right here. on The place that this figure represents, this bluebird. Good heavens. Anyway, bluebird, bluebird and coyote. Um, Hunter Biden. 74 inches tall, 56 inches wide, mixed media on metallic paper. What did I say? Ah, uh, let's see. Yeah, talked about the air, the, the breath, the spirit, the treeless paper. Hunter, wanting to know, what do you see? What do you see? <laughs> what do you see? I'm just like clicking through all the links that I used for um, this video, just to give you a recap. Right? I think I'm I'm ta I'm going to talk about trees in the future. Uh, yep, I'm gonna. I'm going to be back. I'm done for today. So I'm going to be back with the next one. And I don't know which one it'll be. But I'm like I said, I think I want to get through uh, the ones that I think of as self-portraits or indirect self-portraits. I want to get those out the way first and then deal with maybe the more complex ones um, in subsequent installments of this Hunter Biden fall 2021 exhibition video review series so with all that being said i'm gonna reiterate th thank you for watching thank you for listening thank you for learning right along with me and uh you know if you subscribe thank you for subscribing if you haven't subscribed consider it if you liked the video hit the like button and let me know if you didn't like it. Also, let me know in the comments section. I'd love to hear what I could have done better. Um, <laughs> and other than that, people, um, I guess that's it for this video. Like I said, in the next one, yet another painting. I'm going to, you know, start doing more paintings about other topics too. Like I mentioned in this one, The Shining, I might do a book review. I might do a little um, kind of how-to video, you know, how to look at art. I, th I think I've got that one in the works, uh, maybe for tomorrow, maybe the day after. I'm not sure. But all I do, all I am sure about is that I am having great fun doing these videos, and I look forward to having more fun. So until the next video, uh, I will talk at you soon. <laughs> so I guess that's it. I'm going to go ahead and bid you all bye-bye. So, bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>